Till now, we have talked about the reductionist view of sexuality. Uh, we were looking at uh, a philosophical way of uh, understanding this domain of sexuality, uh, particularly in the context of ethics, that uh, we are seeing this as an exercise in applied ethics, that we are taking uh, real life issues or uh, and, and real life decisions and from an ethical perspective or from a philosophical perspective. Uh, the objective of, uh, 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 of, of um, going into this uh, uh, issue and topic of applied ethics, but in general and uh, um, sexuality as an example of this, uh, is to uh, uh, let uh, to to explore how we, as as uh, uh, philosophers and, uh, and and thereby ethicists, delve into the issues of uh, applied ethics. Now, uh, imagine this deliberation uh, taking place, and this deliberation ought to take place on any de decision that takes place uh, that takes um, uh, is taken by the representatives of a collective. So that could be uh, that could be a, a government, a parliament. A board of representatives, or a college council, or uh, uh, an institute, senate, um, anywhere where decisions about uh, uh, collective policies are taken, ought to have a deliberation in this fashion. So, uh, these are examples of applied ethics. So, uh, particularly with the notion of sexuality, say when a, a, a school is uh, or, or a uh, uh, educational institution is trying to come up with a dress code or trying to do away with an existing dress code, uh, what is the thinking that goes behind it? So, to make it articulate and instead of just not depending on the um, preconceived notions of the uh, decision making authority, it is trying to uh, verbalize and uh, articulate and thereof reason and argue about what is the, uh, what would be the best thing to do. So, for many it seems to be uh, an, an, uh, a very uh, implicit uh, uh, decision and which there is nothing much to uh, communicate, share or even discuss about. Well, uh, that is definitely not a philosophical attitude and that is definitely not an attitude uh, for arriving at a consensus in a fair way. So, uh, even if, uh, because as representatives, uh, one is supposed to represent every uh, or, or try to uh, take into account every possible view that every possible uh, member whose representative one is. And therefore, whenever such decisions are taken, we um, what uh, particularly happens in parliaments or should happen in parliaments is a uh, philosophical deliberation. Because when we are concerned with the most general things which affect uh, uh, all the members of a collective and yet are to be decided upon. Uh, in a uh, 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 fashion uh, that that uh, is objective at least for uh, the period of its implementation uh, does require to be uh, delved debated from all perspectives so this is such an example so in this uh, we uh, say uh, deciding on cases like euthanasia or mercy killing or whether the legality of suicide now uh, these are ma major benchmark uh, decisions that are taken and most of us are born into societies or collectives where there are established opinions about these acts but well as human opinions uh, and human beliefs are constantly challenged and revised and an open society always is open to newer views so uh, we are all born into societies with certain uh, uh, ethical or moral values and uh, we do accept them as the default mode but where we make an error is by considering that these values are the final values. So, this process of revision, this process of uh, uh, arriving at uh, delving into the context and arriving uh, at what is most possible, uh, what is the most uh, possible or which is the best policy to bring about uh, the most desirable society uh, is essential to human deliberation by uh, representatives. And uh, if deliberation does not take place, it does uh, mean that there is something, uh, uh, that it, it is a society which is not uh, engaging in a fair way of arriving at uh, uh, values for the collective. So, uh, applied ethics are the, uh, are the most visible uh, places or visible space, where we find that uh, philosophy enters real life and real life enters philosophy. Although, 
I would hold that philosophy cannot be, there cannot be a more practical subject than philosophy because philosophy is the way you lead your life. So, uh, but anyway, for those who are seeking um, the practicality or, or the connect of philosophy with the world out there, perhaps the most visible, perceptible uh, domain would be uh, applied ethics. And in applied ethics, we talk about various issues like we are talking about uh, sexuality today. We are talking about two perspectives uh, or we are trying to build two little theories about sexuality that well, uh, let us say this, this particularly targets a question like is, is, is premarital sex wrong or is, is uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, intercourse without uh, uh, a commitment to be together between two individuals morally reprehensible. Should a society permit homosexuality? Should homosexuality be uh, criminalized or is there something uh, uh, morally wrong about it and therefore, it ought to be uh, ought to be shunned? So, these are questions for the answers to which are not so easily available in the empirical content that we find in the uh, world out there and therefore, we need to uh, debate, discuss and there is scope to debate and discuss, because for many of us, these values seem to be so uh, uh, ordained from our upbringing, that we uh, are unable to see a parallel or a, another way of looking at it. But uh, uh, we need to go ahead, if we do want to live in a uh, society with uh, uh, multiple people or and multiple ways of living, to arrive at a way of living, which is mutually agreed upon or at least attempts in that direction have to be made. to reach whatever sort of agreement we can reach. So, anyway, this was just a little bit of recapitulation of what are we doing when we are doing uh, philosophy, we are doing ethics and we are doing applied ethics. We have talked about various moral theories, we have talked about uh, moral theories in various traditions, in Indian tradition particularly. And uh, now, we were uh, uh, for the past few sessions, we have been talking about applied ethics. So, now we are coming to uh, the non-reductionist view of uh, uh, sexuality. If you look at the slide right now, in the non-reductionist view, uh, the non-reductionist view begins by um, exploring that, uh, how did the reductionist view perhaps come about? Well, as uh, stated earlier that, uh, uh, this notion of sexuality and morality can be seen as the essential conflict between positive and negative liberty. So, uh, when one sees morality as an exercise of positive liberty, uh, denying morality as an exercise of negative liberties, so, negative liberty or perhaps as uh, more simplistically understood as the no harm principle that anything is uh, right unless until it does not harm anybody else. And uh, this is being the bare minimum as a no harm definition of morality. But, uh, for the non-reductionist, well, morality is essentially an exercise of positive liberty, because if the minimum and the only level of morality uh, seems to be in uh, uh, something which does not harm anybody else, uh, well, then uh, the entire non-reductionist uh, domain uh, falls to the ground. So, the non-reductionist does uh, surely start with morality as an exercise of positive liberty. So, uh, what it refutes is that sexuality is in purely aesthetic domain without any moral component. So, it does it does not see sexuality as anything uh, that it is purely aesthetic and without any moral component. So, uh, let us take an example. Um, let us read through the few um, points listed on the screen and then go ahead uh, with the examples about it. Well, human beings have various forms of relations. So, when the third issue point reads that sexual relation vis-a-vis -vis other forms of relations uh, like employee, employer, colleagues, game partners, competitors and uh, uh, there are various kinds of human uh, relations. Now, transactory nature of these associations, can they be extended to the sexual domain without the loss of dignity? What is it, if there is anything at all that distinguishes any human encounter from a uh, sexual con encounter or what is it? unique about sexual encounter that does not make it a part of any other human encounter. Now, what essentially uh, the author here or Vincent Ponzo is trying to put forth is that, well, if I uh, 
In fact, if this example is given that uh, if a person asks another person out for a, uh, say, uh, as, as uh, perhaps an example quoted in the essay itself for a game of tennis, uh, is it of the uh, similar uh, strain when one person asks another person for uh, a sexual encounter? Now, this is where uh, logically, of course, the two demands or the two uh, uh, forms of statements are the same, that both seek some kind of a human uh, interaction and one is seeking the uh, permission or one is seeking the other to join in the uh, game. Now, that is one way of looking at uh, uh, sexuality too. And uh, of course, this is not the non-reductionist way of looking at sexuality, because they do make a distinction between any human encounter and uh, a sexual encounter. So, uh, when, when I am making or when, when, and when any person is making a, a, a claim uh, that uh, there are associations, if, if we see in the third issue here, that uh, there are various forms of relations. There is an employee and an employer. So, if the employee is obliged or agrees to in a contract with the employer to uh, do certain uh, jobs of the employer for a remuneration. Colleagues do the same for each other, uh, maybe voluntarily, game partners play together and to win and uh, competitors uh, play against each other to outbid each other. Now, these kind of uh, relations also have some kind of a transaction that takes place. Now, there seems to be nothing wrong when you pay uh, your dentist for uh, cleaning your teeth, or there seems to be nothing wrong when you, uh, when a patient pays the surgeon for uh, operating a tumor out of his or her uh, uh, body. But if this same transactory nature of this association is, is uh, extended to the sexual domain, and uh, because here comes the very applied question of uh, uh, the uh, moral stand on prostitution, that if uh, just as you, uh, the patient pays the surgeon for uh, uh, his or her uh, skill and services, a patron could uh, pay the prostitute for his or her uh, um, sexual uh, services. Now, this transactory nature, is there a difference between these two kind of transactions? Just as uh, a teacher is paid a, a salary for teaching the uh, students, and um, that is also a kind of a transaction. So, if this transaction can be extended to, uh, uh, to the uh, domain of the personal, and therefore the question rises that if there is anything at all that distinguishes uh, sexual encounter from any human encounter, that is there a category or a definitional distinction between the two. Now, there can be many interesting examples that come up uh, uh, about this, uh, before we go on to read the, the slide. Uh, let me put forth a few questions, that would perhaps uh, uh, bring forth the issue better, and uh, uh, make us think harder on this issue, and why it is relevant. Let us say, I, 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 um, uh, uh, there is a person who is paying, uh, in fact, I would not like to take myself as an example for that, for obvious reasons. Uh, but let us say a person um, would like to uh, uh, play a game of, uh, uh, say, say, or would like to play kabaddi, or any uh, any game like that, and the uh, game requires few more people to play with, and uh, well, he, uh, that person does not find people to play with, so he puts out an advertisement in the paper that well people who are willing to play uh, kabaddi or any other game are uh, may kindly uh, contact me and you will be paid so much per hour and these are all your benefits and these are terms of contract so people would agree maybe somebody would agree and they would come and we could play now he finds that this person also is lonely that he doesn't find uh, people or she doesn't find people to uh, speak to and has a sense of loneliness now if this person extends that kabaddi group uh, advertisement to an advertisement soliciting uh, friends at the payment of a certain uh, 
uh, amount of remuneration per hour of time spent together. Now, from this, the person proceeds and uh, uh, goes ahead to uh, put up an advertisement seeking sexual uh, encounter um, at an agreed remuneration. Now, I see these as uh, uh, three different stages that well, one, one is looking, looking for uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, game partners and not finding one. So, a transactory a transaction is put out, uh, where a remuneration is offered for game partners. And that seems to be perhaps fine to uh, many. And when it extends to uh, putting an advertisement out for a transactory nature of friendship, that seems odd and unusual, because friendship is something perhaps that you have to earn, that, that is not to be bought, that is not a transaction, that has to be not paid by uh, 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 money, but has to be uh, if again sticking to the transactory term, uh, has to be paid by uh, uh, effort, familiarity or by uh, association or common interest. And going further, uh, where uh, uh, seeking a sexual encounter or, uh, for a certain remuneration, prostitution in simple words, is uh, a further uh, 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 requirement uh, of, uh, or of pulling a sexual encounter uh, from the personal domain uh, to a transactory domain. Now, that would perhaps upset many people and they would find them, well, it is something odd, that these are some things that do not or should not be transactory. But many of them would feel perfectly fine that, well, uh, it is nothing, it is not an act of deceit or coercion, it is an open invitation left out and as long as two people agree, one. Uh, uh, who is willing to buy sexual services and one who is willing to sell the same, uh, there is simply no moral uh, issue about it. Well, uh, this matter is definitely not so simple and never a resolution is waiting off hand. It depends on what value do you value more. Do you value uh, a person's liberty more than uh, um, a person's dignity at least, if not to himself or herself, as how others would pursue. This would again be seen as a classical case of a debate between uh, 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 positive liberty and negative liberty. So, is there anything about the sexual en encounter, which makes it different from any other human encounter? Friendship as a human encounter seems to be uh, the beginning of a personal encounter, that it is not a professional association, that it is not a transactory association, at least not transactory in the, in terms of uh, uh, money. And uh, a sexual encounter seems to be the peak of a personal interaction and therefore, definitely not, uh, not a transactory uh, uh, association, especially for uh, money. Now, these, these are, these could be the views of a non-reductionist. A reductionist, on the other hand, could be particularly be fine with purchasing friends, as long as people are willing to sell and um, somebody is willing to buy, it seems to be a transaction done. And uh, there is no reason why governments, morals, policies, society or anybody should interfere. Um, well, different nations, right at this time, also follow different uh, uh, philosophies of what is the good life. And, and therefore, uh, they, they uh, have different policies on this, but uh, let us see how the non-reductionist continues to extrapolate the reason why uh, uh, it sees the rise of uh, or, or uh, the prevalence of reductionism about sexuality. The understanding, and this is, I particularly uh, um, quote from uh, Vincent Punzo, uh, is when he say, uh, understands that sexuality has come to play such a prominent role in commercial transactions, like advertisements. Well, sexuality is used to sell everything and anything, that it seems perfectly natural to include sexuality itself in a commercial barter. And now, look at it, the gradations. We can give, think of numerous examples, that, uh, uh, well, why are uh, things sold by, uh, uh, right beginning from good looking people to um, extremely sexually attractive or provocative people? because that pulls in their attention. And that uh, uh, sexual charm 
can be used to uh, hold people's attention and thereof to introduce products to these people, uh, to the audience and thereby have a greater chance of uh, uh, making a sell. So, this is an example of using sexuality as an asset, as a natural asset. Now, if so be the case, what is the problem if we uh, uh, consider full fledgedly sexuality as uh, uh, an element in the commercial butter tot in toto? This portrays a possible extrapolation of the current significant ethos of amoralizing sexuality and thereby enabling it to be included in the commercial framework. So, this uh, uh, widespread use of sexuality in uh, as an instrument or an, as an asset to um, enable commercial transactions definitely extrapolates into finally, amoralizing sexuality and just seeing it as an ability, just as intelligence is an ability, the surgeon's skill is an ability. So, the prostitute's sexual skill is an ability and therefore, uh, it is uh, sexuality is amoralized as the reductionist would want it to be or understand it to be, understand it to be and thereby enabling it to be included in the commercial framework. This tends according to the non-reductionist, this tends to cause the reductionist outlook to sex and sexuality. Now, what does the non-reductionist say? Well, the argument as per Punzo is, human beings are not physical beings alone. Uh, they have non-physical dimensions too. For instance, a historical dimension for one. Two, the historical dimension is being aware of one's past, it influencing our present decisions and the present decisions taken in the light of future consequences. This conscious linearity of lived time enables us to bond and associate with another uniting uh, with another, uniting our purpose and sharing our journey. Sexual intercourse is a way of asserting the totality of this mutual commitment. And this is a feature of sex that the reductionist fails to, fails or refuses to see. So, well, this is now a classical case of an argument by a non-reductionist. Now, the non-reductionist is claiming that, well, what is a human person? Now, consider, uh, look at it this way, how uh, an applied ethical question extrapolates into uh, what one's metaphysical assumptions are. So, uh, Punzo goes ahead and which I take, uh, have taken as the, an example of a non-reductionist arguing about sexuality. Punzo goes on to cite human beings as in, in a very uh, uh, non-debatable way. Uh, allotting or allocating or talking about a non-physical component about the human person. Ponzo could as well as talk about the human soul, but of course, that is much more debatable. What is much less debatable and empirically more easily demonstrable is the historical nature of human being or a human person, that we are essentially physical entities, yes, but we are also historical entities, historical entities in the sense that we have memories, that we remember our past, that our past shapes our present and the decisions we can take today uh, uh, can be the decisions that affect our future and we do have our future under our control. So, there is a kind of uh, historicity to our existence that we are not, uh, uh, our life is not a series of accidents uh, held together uh, or lived together. Whereas our life is a series of choices, choices which are influenced by our past experiences and choices that we make in light of our future uh, uh, desires and future and the way, place where we want to see ourselves in the future. Now, imagine this is such a simple and almost many of us would find it a trivial uh, truth of life, but it is essential to articulate, to verbalize it, to make it conscious, so as to go ahead and uh, see what this could lead to. So, I mean, we all know that we remember our past, that and we learn from our past, and we, uh, if if we if we would like, if I would like to see my in, see myself any thinner uh, in the next year, I would like to work hard for that. So, I would work hard because I have an idea or, or I have a desire to uh, be thinner next year. So, 
it is a very simple uh, uh, goal. But what uh, being a historic being, that means I can take decisions today in light of my requirements for tomorrow. So, if I want to see myself much thinner next year, I would like to work hard or take some steps to uh, reach that place. So, this does not seem so unique if you compare yourself with other human beings or human persons, but this seems unique when you compare yourselves with other forms of existence. That we can have goals, we are goal seeking creatures, that we have goals and we can modify our present behavior to attain future goals. So, this historicity or this historical dimension of uh, uh, a human person is essentially also a uh, dimension of uh, uh, a human self. And therefore, now a human person, now uh, this is of course, uh, we are not going into details of the model, but it will perhaps give you an idea how to theorize or how to build a model. Uh, so, what we are essentially working at is the what is a human person? A human person is not just the human body, but also this, uh, uh, this uh, ability of making choices and this ability or this uh, uh, continuity of memory and historicity that a human person has. And as you see the point number 3 in the slide, this conscious linearity, this conscious linearity of lived time enables us to bond and associate with another uniting our purpose and sharing our journey. So, this is the crucial uh, uh, premise that the non-reductionist uh, adds on that well, we are definitely not only physical beings, but we are also have a historical dimension to our being and existence. And this historical dimension is in our choice and we can uh, and this conscious linearity of lived time gives us the choice to associate, to bond with another, uniting our purpose and sharing our journey. Now, sexual intercourse is a way of asserting the totality of this mutual commitment. So, when we choose to share our journey and unite our purpose with, our, with another person, we are making a choice. We are trying to combine uh, the historicity of two people. So, if two people are making a choice to uh, live their lives together, so, they are making a, a, a commitment to make choices that will keep them together, that will keep their purposes united and that their journeys will be together, journeys through life will be together. And being historical beings, we have this ability. Uh, we are not like uh, two parallel lines running together. In fact, we can choose to be, uh, choose the direction that the lines would take, analogically speaking. So, Punzo puts forth that sexual intercourse is actually a way of asserting the totality of this mutual commitment between two people. And this is a feature of uh, sex that the reductionist or the uh, fails or refuses to see. Now, Punzo also talks about this notion of existential integrity. Now, having known the, uh, uh, having, having uh, put forth the notion of a person as a historical being and not just uh, limited to a physical being, Punzo uses the notion of existential integrity as the corner stone to explicate a non-reductionistic conception of sexuality. A holistic notion of human personhood incorporates the physical and at least the historical. It could be much more, but Punzo has very, uh, if I may say uh, wisely or very um, cleverly chosen a uh, um, a criteria, a non-physical criteria of human existence, which is obvious without any metaphysical presuppositions. So, uh, which is empirical, which seems to be commonsensically or empirically obvious. So, a holistic notion of human personhood incorporates the physical and at least the historical, uh, a uniting on one plane of the physical, sexual and not doing so on another plane, which is the historical plane is a violation of the integrity of existence, for we exist as a unitary. The human body is the locus of the human self, and if considered as a unitary, the body and the self are to act in unison. To disregard this integrity is to give up on existential integrity. Now, uh, when Punzo talks about existential integrity, now imagine these are 
uh, attempts of theory building of where concepts are being taken together, knitted together and the knit is justified or the justification is being put forth to the reader or the audience and a theory is being built. What Punzo is saying that well, we are physical beings that is empirically perceivable, but we are not just physical beings. We also have a historicity attached to us, a very well chosen non-physical criteria which is easy to. Uh, 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 to, to uh, demonstrate and to experience and to, um, to, to uh, hold as true. So, uh, if I say that we have a non-physical self or soul to us, well many of us will would dispute that at the current level of uh, understanding and rightly so. But if we say, if I say that well many of us are or that we are historical beings and we remember and uh, we have the ability to make choices for our future, perhaps there will be a much larger number of people agreeing to it, because this is a part of the uh, current uh, makeup of the human psyche, or at least the majority of the people would agree with this. However, that does not concern us, that how many do agree or do not agree. Now, let us look at Punzo's model, when he talks about existential integrity. So, what is human existence? Human existence, now this is again uh, uh, laying down metaphysical assumption or not assumptions, but metaphysical presuppositions to uh, uh, put forth uh, Punzo's own view. So, what is the metaphysical pres uh, presupposition? That we are human beings, biologically, physically, but as persons we are not only human beings. We remember, we are historical beings. So, we, we historical in the sense that we uh, have a knit through lived time experience or temporal experience. And being historical beings, say we have two planes of existence that well, as a physical being I, I uh, exist on the physical plane, but as a historical being I exist on another plane or I exist in another way the way we interact. Now, uh, if I see that uh, 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 if I say, uh, give a smile of familiarity to somebody else, whom I have been knowing for the past and liking for the past uh, many years, it is not a physical event that is taking place according to Punzo. According to the non-reductionist or the various plane understanding of uh, uh, layers of human personhood, uh, it is not my physical body that is smiling at the physical uh, body uh, or the perception of the physical body of another person. That is happening, but that is happening because we are historically linked, that we have been perhaps a team, that we have known each other and we have uh, uh, have some good uh, 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 moments together and therefore, we like each other. Now, these are not something which are physical. This is what Punzo puts as historical existence. So, uh, when we live on these planes and human beings, but finally we are a single person, that uh, person who is uh, smiling uh, at the sight of a familiar uh, person is not somebody else or not different from the body that is smiling. When I say that the person is smiling, the person is smiling, the body, the lips are elongated and the teeth are visible, but that is the physical component. That the person is smiling is uh, another component, that is an expression of joy, that is an uh, evidence of mental life. That the physical uh, uh, reflects the elongation of the uh, lips and the visibility of the teeth and the nod uh, and the gleam in the eye are, uh, let us drop the gleam in the eye, because that is not purely uh, physical reading of it, but just reading it as how a machine would see or how uh, a machine would see a person smiling, would see that well the uh, uh, face muscle seems to be elongated and uh, the teeth are visible and uh, uh, the face gives a nod or the head gives a nod. That is the physical component, but surely when uh, that is how perhaps a uh, untrained machine would read uh, the change in physical space, but what you as an observer with your uh, knowledge background would see that well one a person familiar with another is meeting and they seem to uh, uh, give a nod to each other, which does indicate that they have 
had a genuine, uh, they have had uh, known and perhaps even liked each other. So, uh, nothing very uh, uh, revealing about this uh, uh, unraveling this metaphysical presupposition, but what is interesting is the articulation of this. And this articulation thus makes us, or as per Punzo, or the non-reductionist brigade would put forth that, well, we are two different, uh, 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 we are working over two different planes, that the physical smiling and the mental joy of meeting are two different planes, and the historicity is just one plane like that. There may be many other planes. Punzo takes the example of only historicity as a another plane. So, when we have these two planes of existence, but we are not existing in a binary. We are finally, the same person who, whose face uh, muscles are elongating, or whose lips seem to elongate, and uh, uh, head seems to nod. That body is same as the person, which uh, is conveying the greeting. So, here, Punzo puts forth that, well, we have different planes. Yet, we are a unitary, we are the same person. Now, coming back to sexuality, well, uh, uh, and existential integrity, that well, when on the physical plane, uh, 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 a sexual encounter is the closest possible physical encounter with another human being, is an encounter in one plane. And whereas, without having any mutuality, commitment or uh, affection on the uh, historical plane, or uh, having any commitment to uh, share the journey together, is a violation of existential integrity. That we are uh, 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 achieving maximum intimacy at a physical level, but uh, being indifferent on a uh, historical level, or a mental level. But we are the same person. So, that is what leads to a kind of violation of existential integrity, that well, we are making a, a physical uh, uh, intimacy, and not making a uh, historic or mental intimacy. Now, that is what leads to a, um, a violation of existential, uh, existential integrity, and that is why the non-reductionist view of sexuality would see, uh, that sexuality also, or a sexual encounter also entails a uh, joining together of lives, because it is both, just as it is so um, integrated, that the physical body smiling, in the example just mentioned, uh, a physical body showing the physical correlates, or physical features of smiling, and the person smiling, seems to be so correlated, that we do not find that there is a space for binary, and it seems so naturally integrated. Whereas, uh, Punzo extends this integration to even the sexual encounter. That a sexual encounter, without a, uh, uh, a historical, or, or a commitment to be together, seems uh, like a violation of existential integrity. While the case of smiling is, well, uh, when, when you could say, uh, another case of uh, violation of existential integrity, in the smiling example would be, when the person smiles, or, or physically displays all the features of smiling, but does not feel that way. So, pretends or fakes a smile. Now, that is again a violation of existential integrity. So, Punzo is trying to put forth that as crucial to uh, uh, human existential integrity. And just as one would uh, uh, greet a person with a physical smile, but not feeling uh, that smile, is a violation of existential integrity, because having a uh, a physical uh, smile, and not having the corresponding feeling with it, is uh, uh, is breaking the integrity of our existence. That at one level we are uh, putting forth a, uh, a, 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 a promise of, uh, or we are putting forth a symbol of, uh, uh, I won't say intimacy, but a, sim a symbol of friendliness. Whereas at another level, the mental level, we are not putting forth that. So, that is as much as a violation of uh, uh, intimacy, or uh, sorry, which, which is a violation of uh, uh, existential integrity. So, um, what uh, uh, in the slide, if you see the last point, uh, in the current slide, 
uh, Punzo does say that the human body is the locus of human self and if considered as a unitary, the self and the body, the body and the self are to act in unison. To act and to feel it, that is what the uh, non-reductionists would say. To disregard this integrity is to give up on existential integrity. Now, what does this bring about? This brings about this notion of depersonalization. Punzo goes on uh, to regard, uh, there is a uh, typo there. Punzo goes on to regard that sexual unions that take place without any mutual commitment, and even if this lack of mutuality is stated and accepted by the partners, it is still morally deficient because it depersonalizes their bodily existence. For such an act segregates, even though if in consent, the body, the most intimate physical expression of the self from the self itself. This is using a part of an individual as a means for the uh, individual and demeaning the part, the body as a mere means. So, what is this notion of depersonalization that uh, um, Punzo is talking about? Well, he says that well, any notion, in any uh, uh, sexual union that takes place which without mutuality is uh, depersonalizing the individual, because the individual is one, is unitary and the individual uses or, or attains intimacy at a physical level, without an mutuality and intimacy at the uh, mental level, seems to be uh, uh, apart from a violation of existential integrity, seems to depersonalize or uh, 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 downgrade the physical component of one's existence, of using one's body as a means, even if on mutual consent, that uh, uh, we, we uh, use one's body as an instrument as a, or as a means uh, to transact and to uh, attain uh, pleasure. So, this using of, as we find in the second reason that Punzo gives, that such an act segregates the body, the most intimate physical expression of the self, from the self itself. And this is using a part of an individual as a means for the individual and demeaning the part, that is the body as mere means. So, it depersonalizes the human being. So, as very commonly said that uh, um, uh, prostitution depersonalizes human beings, that is uh, the physical self is the closest physical expression of uh, one as a person. Uh, it does uh, uh, beg of a little bit of abstraction uh, to uh, fully appreciate this claim that uh, Punzo is making or any non-reductionist claim. Uh, Let us say I express myself and I am attached to the clothes I wear, to the things I possess, uh, to a particularly, uh, uh, I'm particularly fond of uh, a fountain pen that suppose my grandfather gave it to me and I have enjoy writing with it. So, I have a paraphernalia of physical things around me, which make me feel like me, which allow me to express myself. Uh, say my moustache expresses myself, my uh, uh, clothes express me, my, uh, uh, my motorcycle expresses me and I choose things around me, because they express me. So, having a fashion statement is when I choose things to express myself, that well I would like this kind of clothes and I would not like that kind of clothes, because I find that these kind of clothes express myself better or express me better than those kind of clothes. Now, these are physical uh, uh, things around me that help me express myself to others, to myself. Preceding all these uh, uh, things that help me express myself is fundamentally my physical body. It is the most intimate 
physical connect. In fact, the only perhaps uh, 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 physical connect to my uh, self. And this is in no way assuming or claiming that the self is something uh, independent of the body or anything like that. It is actually holding what is known as a holistic view, that uh, we are an individual. And this individual has many components. And of these components, together make the individual. So, it is like an emergence of an individual from the various components or uh, the individual supervenes on certain components. But anyway, that you need not worry about that right now. So, uh, when I depersonalize myself, I, when I uh, lend my uh, 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 clothes to somebody else to wear, or when I sell that fountain pen that I am very fond of and that has historical value to me, because my grandfather gifted it to me and uh, we have been using, uh, using it for generations. I am in a way, uh, letting my personal domain away as a transaction. But the epitome of my personal domain is my physical body. And by engaging in uh, a sexual encounter without any uh, 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 historical or mental correlate, I am actually depersonalizing my body. So, it is going further and further ahead and the uh, I am uh, engaging. Uh, uh, the skill of a surgeon is uh, farther away to the surgeon than the body of the surgeon is to a surgeon. So, when I am uh, uh, or when a person is is uh, uh, is, is using one's body as the means, one is depersonalizing or removing that uh, entity, which may be as far as your uh, uh, clothes and your fountain pen to as close as your physical body. The ultimate, the most intimate, uh, uh, the most intimate physical uh, uh, component that we have to a unitary person. And uh, as you see, uh, and then Tunzo lists that uh, uh, this is uh, the final uh, uh, justification in depersonalization, that this is using a part of an individual as a means for the individual and demeaning the part or the body as the mere means. So, the body is no more seen as a component, but is seen, is seen as an instrument. Well, one could look at it this way. I am just drawing an interesting analogy, which is purely mine, and uh, I take full responsibility for it. Um, cultures, which seem to see uh, uh, mentality as essential and body as a means or an, uh, or an animal burden on this mentality or this notion of self, uh, will perhaps be more comfortable on using the body as means for existence. Whereas, uh, uh, the world view which would see uh, human being as an unitary self, or a unitary self combining the physicality and mentality would give an equal status and dignity to the physicality of human existence, and would find something wrong in using it as the, uh, as, as, as a means of uh, uh, anything else. So, um, well, when then Punzo says that, uh, uh, the means for the individual. So, when we use the body as the means for the individual, we are actually demeaning it, depersonalizing it. Uh, Punzo goes ahead and uh, uh, claims that, uh, and talks about chastity, which seems to be a frequently ridiculed word. Um, as, as something uh, which uh, is Victorian in origin, which is, is a symbol of prudery. Uh, Punzo claims that, well, the chaste man rejects depersonalized sexual relations as a reduction of man in his most intimate physical being to the status of an object or pure instrument for another. He asserts that a man, that man is a subject and end in himself, not in some transtemporal non-physical world but in the historical physical world in which he carries on his moral task, and where he finds his fellow man. He will not freely make of himself, in his bodily existence, a thing to be handed over to another's possession, nor will he ask that another treat his own body 
in this way. The total physical intimacy of sexual intercourse will be an expression of total union with the other self on all levels of their beings. Now, Punzo puts forth a very uh, high ideal and a claim that is uh, intensely uh, metaphysical too, uh, claiming that what is this notion of chastity? This notion of chastity is or being chaste is one who uh, uh, gives equal credence and value to one's physicality as one's non-physicality and takes it all together. The total and sexual intercourse will be an expression of the total union with the other self on all levels of their beings. So, uh, um, yes, uh, Punzo does raise the ideal and in fact talks about uh, a sexual encounter being an encounter uh, at uh, uh, all levels between two human persons and physical physicality being one of those levels equally respectable, equally important and equally necessary. Isolating that uh, uh, or um, an engagement at the, at the sexual physical level without a corresponding engagement at any other uh, component level of a human person. Uh, is a unchaste act, is an act wherein one is not being, uh, one is existential integrity is violated, one depersonalizes one body and, and this is what perhaps was meant when, uh, uh, when, when we asked it to be chaste or when, when uh, tradition and when the notions of chastity were worked out. Let us look at it, uh, uh, this as a further example of theory building and see now that we have put forth the uh, ontological claims of non-reductionism, um, uh, what does, uh, uh, what are the consequences that follow? What follows of marriage then? Well, considering the just proposed model of understanding human sexuality, marriage would mean a mutual and total commitment of two individuals to share the problems and prospects of their historical existence in the world. It involves a full existential sharing on the part of the two beings of the burdens, opportunities and challenges of their historical existence. So, having this interpretation of an existential connect, uh, let us look at one of the various consequences that follow and Punzo talks about marriage there, is that uh, consider, uh, considering this proposed model of understanding of human sexuality. Marriage would essentially mean a mutual and total commitment of the two individuals to share the problems and prospects of their historical existence in the world. These are the two quoted uh, from Punzo, the key, uh, the key notions regarding a marriage, where uh, marriage is a mutual and total commitment of two individuals of their uh, physical intimacy, which also reflects in their historical uh, intimacy. Their their commitment to share the problems and prospects and of their historical existence in the world. So, it goes ahead to say that, uh, and I quote from Punzo, that it involves a full existential sharing on the part of the two beings of the burdens, opportunities and challenges of their historical existence. So, these were uh, two perspectives on a philosophical analysis of sexuality. They were attempt uh, these were attempts to build a little a theory of sexuality justifying the claims and following through some of the consequences. So, uh, we take this as an uh, uh, example, these two uh, ways, the non-reductionist and the reductionistic understanding of sexuality and how these little theories that we have about sexuality would determine uh, applied decisions. So, uh, uh, for instance, let me uh, just take a quick example that when, when it comes to uh, uh, say uh, premarital uh, uh, sexuality, it is uh, uh, for the sake of uh, 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 without any mutual commitment. For the reductionist, it would be fine that as long as both the uh, uh, people engaged in it are. Uh, uh, are okay with it and are aware of each other's intentions, there is no deceit, it seems to be fine. Uh, but for uh, uh, 
the non-reductionist view that well even if both of them are aware of each other's intentions and are okay with it, there is something demeaning about the very act in which they are entering. They are demeaning themselves by not uh, uh, fully engaging or living up to the uh, possibility of a uh, total union. So, anyway these were the examples of uh, how uh, metaphysics is also connected to ethics, the kind of uh, presuppositions that we have um, and influences the kind of opinions and decisions that we make. So, with this I uh, uh, leave you all to engage in your little uh, theoretical enterprise and uh, um, uh, understand what are common nuances of the world uh, from a philosophical outlook and not to give in to um, uh, not to give in to understanding what comes to us which is embedded because of where and who and what we are, but also to question the embedded uh, knowledge that comes to us and to articulate it to make it conscious and to understand it better. With this I would uh, come to an end. Thank you.